This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. This show continues to be the only productive thing I've done during the pandemic, so thanks for tuning in and for bearing witness. Here's what we've got for y'all today. Some college students are heading back to campus with some added pandemic complications to go along with their course loads. We'll have a story explaining more on that. And pro sports are back, but will college teams be able to follow? That story is later in the show. But first, here's what you need to know right now. At least nine cities are seeing a concerning uptick in COVID-19 cases. On a phone call with state and local officials, Dr. Deborah Burks said the White House response team is closely watching Atlanta, Baltimore, Kansas City, Portland, Omaha, Chicago, Boston, Detroit, DC, and California's Central Valley. But there is some good news. There are positive signs that the trends are starting to improve across the South. Here's what Dr. Anthony Fauci had to say about taking control of the situation. If we pay attention to the fundamental tenets of infection control and diminution of transmission, we could be way down in November. It is entirely conceivable. It isn't inevitable. Some cities are taking things into their own hands to control the spread of the virus. New York City officials set up checkpoints at bridges and tunnels to remind people out of state to quarantine. And in Los Angeles, the mayor took a drastic step, giving the city's water and power company authority to shut off service to properties where large parties are being held. For the 20th straight week, at least 1 million Americans have signed up for unemployment aid. Last week, jobless claims did drop slightly from the week before, but the numbers still show things are far from normal. Right now, a total of 161 million people are receiving unemployment benefits. This is the first week they won't receive an added $600 payment. Congress is working toward a new relief deal to resume that extra weekly payment, but negotiations are being stalled, with Republicans looking to cut that payment down and Democrats aiming to maintain the payment. The Senate did cancel its scheduled recess that was set to begin tomorrow to instead work on finding middle ground. Meanwhile, the president is threatening to take things into his own hands through an executive order. The attorneys general of New York and DC just made moves to dissolve the National Rifle Association over allegations of fraud and abuse. They both filed lawsuits against the NRA today. Since the NRA is a nonprofit based in New York, the AG does have the power to force the organization to quit operations or dissolve. The lawsuit in DC zeroed in on the association's charitable arm. This comes after an 18 month investigation found millions of dollars worth of funds were misused. The trouble for the organization started when it went from a $28 million surplus in 2015 to a $36 million deficit just three years later. The lawsuit also calls for the removal of Wayne LaPierre, who is accused of spending millions of dollars without the board's approval. He's been in charge of the NRA's day-to-day -day operations since 1991. 2020 has become a perfect storm year for gun sales, and that storm started turning way back in March. Do you have any shotguns left? Yeah, no, we're out of shotguns. We cannot keep things on the shelf for more than just a couple hours. People coming in, hey, do you have ammo? Do you have, do you have uh, ear and eye protection? Do you have firearms? Do you have anything? Fast forward to the summer, and it's estimated that Americans bought more guns in June than in any other month over the last 20 years. Those sales numbers are estimates since sales are difficult to track, so many experts also look at the number of background checks conducted. Regardless of metric, June was unprecedented and July wasn't far behind. Now, gun owners aren't a monolith. People don't all buy guns for the same reason, but industry experts, interviews with gun owners, and survey data all point to the same major factor, the coronavirus. We're just like, well, maybe now is the time, just in case mm -hmm. like something crazy happens or people start losing their minds. Maybe it'd be better to have one and, and not need it than need it and not have it. But COVID-19 isn't the only contributing factor. Protests for racial justice and the upcoming general election have also boosted gun sales. Advocates for stricter gun laws see the surge as a worrying trend. The data tells us more guns lead to a higher risk of injuries within a gun owner's own household. Even Second Amendment communities have expressed similar concerns about this new trend. There are a bunch of first-time gun owners probably in need of some training, and some gun enthusiasts have stepped in to offer that training online in lieu of in-person training. Due to a bunch of scary stuff happening around the world right now, a bunch of people have entered into the gun world and you're now gun owners. So guys, welcome. The backdrop for all of this is a five-digit number, 40,000. That's the number of people killed by gunfire every year. Most of those deaths are suicides. There's a much larger number of people injured or somehow affected by gun violence. 
We don't yet know what long-term effects increased gun ownership will have on Americans, but data tells us the number of purchases in 2020 will likely continue climbing. After all, sales tend to increase around an election, which means the world's most gun-loving nation is also arming up that much more. College students already know this fall semester won't be anything like last year. Forget back-to-school parties. In some states, your first weekend's back will consist of self-quarantining. Amy Morona explains the added complications for college students. As college students nationwide get ready to head back to school, places including New York, Massachusetts, and Washington, D.C. are recommending or requiring some out-of-state students to self-quarantine before classes begin. Some say it's adding extra financial hardship, such as paying for a place to stay before classes begin, on top of an already uncertain academic year. I go to a SUNY for a reason. I don't have money to go to, like, a fancy school, so it has been really hard financially. Eunice Ledris attends one of New York's 28 state universities and doesn't want to take all of her classes online. Out-of-state and international enrollment has reportedly been on the rise for colleges nationwide. While states like Hawaii and Florida are offering academic exemptions to quarantining, the Empire State isn't one of them. Since she's coming from Nevada, one of the more than 30 states currently on New York's restricted travel list, her quarantine was mandated or punishable by a fine. She had to apply for financial help to help buy a last-minute plane ticket and start her lease early before classes began on August 24th. I can't apply for emergency funds forever, so I have to like, figure out and I would have to think about getting a job to pay for everything, but then that's dangerous because of COVID. Roughly 200 miles away at Syracuse University, new and transfer students can complete their quarantine at a limited number of on-campus locations. Some schools like Cornell University are encouraging students in hotspot states to stay home and begin the fall semester online. They aren't offering any on-campus spots for students to quarantine, leaving them to find places to stay themselves. That could be difficult in smaller college towns with limited off-campus housing options or hotels. We're all anticipating that prices are going to shoot way up and it's going to really disadvantage um, the students who kind of need it the most. Um, what I have been really heartened to see is that students are kind of mobilizing around this issue and creating resource spreadsheets and like Google Forms where students can sign up to help provide housing for each other. Plus, like with many things this year, there are variables. Students will have to take on some self-responsibility to effectively quarantine and additional states could get added to or removed from restricted travel lists currently in place. And while some higher education experts say it's unlikely for a governor to implement additional quarantine restrictions this close to a new semester, they admit it may just be delaying the inevitable. Governors don't want to make the decision that forces colleges online, but also colleges would like governors to make the decision that forces them online. So we've reached a little bit of a, a game of chicken right now where nobody wants to take the, the fall for the inevitability that fall will be online. Amy Morona, Newsy, Washington. When you're back, we'll take a look at how colleges are looking to hurdle coronavirus concerns for their athletic teams. That was pretty corny, wasn't it? This is Newsy. Moving beyond nonpartisan, Newsy is anti-partisan. Because we're tired of pundits, of everyone else's opinion. Be informed, not influenced. Ah, uh, sure. Memes and cat videos are fun, but actual news might be a bit more useful. Follow Newsy on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get straightforward, opinion-free news right on your social news feed. Sports are in a league of their own when it comes to the coronavirus. There's no universal solution, and while there has been some luck with the NBA and their bubbles, colleges may not be able to replicate that. Austin Kim shows us the factors they have to consider. The NBA has its bubble. The NHL is playing in hub cities. Some professional sports leagues are isolating teams so they can compete during the coronavirus pandemic. But for college sports, those ideas might not be the right fit. Schools have to overcome a number of issues unique to collegiate athletics. It's a really complicated issue, and I can tell you there's no common answer to that question. Among those complications, the fact that the NCAA classifies athletes as amateurs. 
Until recently, the organization was adamantly against players making money because they don't consider them pro athletes. That's why there's concern about playing in a bubble. You are restricted for the sole purposes of playing games that are highly commercialized and are going to pr produce a lot of money for us as universities. That would be very problematic and no one in college sports wants to do that because then you really are openly admitting that they're employees at that point. Some of the major conferences are scaling back their schedules, but that still involves groups of people traveling to different states, which increases the risk of contracting the virus. Plus, there's the campus element that factors into all of this. That even if everyone is careful in the collegiate sports environment, as well as in colleges, there are going to be cases of COVID on campus. That was a concern brought up in a call between Southeastern Conference officials and SEC football players. The Washington Post obtained audio of that call. One player expressed concern about students returning to campus and going to class with others who could unknowingly infect the athletes. To the credit of a conference like the SEC, they are having this dialogue, you know, with some players. You know, they leaked out. They didn't want it to be leaked out. But I think the fundamental part is that the players aren't hearing the answers of, of what will make them feel safe. The NCAA has urged colleges and universities to create plans for athletes to train on campus safely. Among the actions it took, setting up a hotline for athletes to anonymously report institutions that don't follow all of the COVID-19 protocols. Major conferences are still holding out hope. That's because there's a financial incentive. If sports like football don't return, they are going to face some major financial challenges. Um, and a lot of it is because of the way that they are so um, addicted, for lack of a better word, um, to football revenue. That is a huge part of their model, and it pays for everything else. And college sports has a major spending problem. That cash goes to extravagant facilities and multi-million dollar coaching salaries. But Solomon says we may see a change in that spending in light of the economic fallout of the pandemic. Austin Kim, Newsy, Chicago. This wasn't covered in the story, but if your team stinks this year, just use COVID as an excuse like this. Yeah, we would have gone undefeated if not for the coronavirus. You're welcome. Miss getting email that isn't junk? You should know about Newsy's daily newsletter. It's breaking news right to your inbox. Get caught up quick with the best Newsy stories every day. Join us at signup.newsy.com. Be informed, not influenced. This week, we saw the horrors associated with an unexpected explosion that tore through a port and surrounding neighborhoods in Beirut. More than 100 people were killed in that blast. Today marks the 75th anniversary of an even more devastating explosion that killed hundreds of thousands of people in Hiroshima, Japan. Newsy's Kat Sandoval explains how survivors are still dealing with the effects from that blast. But it took only one B-29, the Enola Gay to close that chapter in human history. 75 years after the U.S. dropped atomic bombs in Japan during World War II, Hiroshima on August 6 and Nagasaki on August 9, survivors of the A-bomb are still suffering from the effects. While the U.S. said it used the weapon to end the war quicker and prevent the loss of American lives, the atomic bombs killed an estimated 120,000 people in Hiroshima and 74,000 in Nagasaki. Michiko Kodama, then a child, said she saw a girl with her face half burned. The girl collapsed and I think she probably passed away. I don't know. But even now, when I speak about her, I almost cry. It's a girl's sad, sad eyes. The memory of that day is seared on the minds of survivors like Kodama. But it's not just the traumatic memories they carry, but health problems as well. The Radiation Effects Research Foundation is a joint U.S. and Japanese institute that examines the effect of radiation on survivors to this day. Cancer is the primary risk for radiation after the atomic bombings. That's Chief of Research Robert Ehrlich. Leukemia is a very rare disease, and but there was a significant and a kind of a big effect of the exposure for an increased risk for leukemia, for certain types of leukemia, um, 
over the first few years after exposure. Ulrich says due to the radiation, the survivors who are now mostly in their 80s and 90s are prone to cancers like breast and lung cancer. About 30% of the original 120,000 survivors who participated in the Research Foundation lifespan study are still alive. The study has led to safe radiation limits in hospitals around the world and used by NASA to determine radiation limits for space exploration. Despite the global contributions, Ulrich says survivors were treated more like data than like people during the early phase of the research right after the war. They weren't treated, you know, with, with care and with uh, humanity uh, as much as, as they should have been. A-bomb survivors, or hibakusha, were often discriminated against. It was hard to get married as a survivor for fear they would pass radiation to the next generation, though current research doesn't show strong evidence that radiation is passed down. There was job discrimination and fears that somehow the radiation was contagious, but it wasn't. In my heart, I still feel hurt from the discrimination. That is what sits the heaviest in my heart. At 82 years old, Kadama continues to share her story so future generations will remember the horrific long-term effects of the A-bomb. She says her suffering is far from over. Nuclear weapons aren't gone. Nuclear weapons that made us suffer for decades still exist. So to me, the war isn't over. Kat Sandoval, Newsy. We're going to show you a few ads, but in the meantime, hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the loop. It'll add to your overall screen time, but hey, you'll likely get a personalized message directly from me. Totally worth it, right? There's three American girls competing for the top two Olympic spots. I could go into this and come out with nothing. Newsy, we're focused on facts and solutions. Talking with medical workers on the front lines, decision makers, and everyday people. All of us fighting COVID-19. Newsy, be informed, not influenced. Making a movie is not cheap, and the pandemic is adding roughly 10% to production costs, according to a Hollywood Radio and Television Society panel. To get projects back on track, some companies are looking into virtual production. Casey Mendoza shows us how it works and why it could be here to stay. The film and TV industry is trying to figure out, like the rest of us, how to work remotely during the pandemic. And one of the solutions has actually been around for a while, virtual production. You know, when we think of virtual production, we think of it as a series of different tools that you deploy on film to solve a problem. But I do believe that it represents uh, a, a, a huge paradigm shift in the, in the way that films will be made in the, the future. To give a specific example of what a virtual production looks like, here's a shot from TV's The Mandalorian. What you think is a sky is actually an LED wall developed by Industrial Light and Magic. Over half of the show's first season was filmed using that technology as a substitute for real location shoots. Effectively, what we do is we use technology to help filmmakers tell better stories. Chris Farreter is the CEO of Halon Entertainment, a visualization company that's been around since 2003. Some of their most recent projects include The Mandalorian, Ford vs. Ferrari, and Ad Astra. We're able to, uh, you know, really see the movie before you really ever put an actor on stage. A cornerstone of Halon's work involves pre-visualizing films to help filmmakers plan ahead. But the company has also been developing strategies for remote work, from scanning real-life places for location scouts to see in virtual reality platforms, to creating virtual environments entirely, so full physical sets won't have to be found or built. I think that that is already the, uh, the direction we were heading in. You know, filmmaking it on, a, on a grander scale is very much a worldwide event sometimes, right? You have locations all over the place, you have people coming in from everywhere. The best way to facilitate that is remote. 
The pandemic accelerated the need for virtual productions, but they won't go away once actors and crews are back on physical sets. This year's Emmy Awards will be fully virtual, and that could help us understand how virtual productions can be used going forward. We've been banging the drum on utilizing real-time technology to solve a lot of these problems for a long time. And we got into a situation now where where people really have to consider it or even embrace it. Casey Mendoza, Newsy, Chicago. We're going to close things out today with a little bit of a plug. Our own Newsy Bellingcat series is now our own Emmy-nominated Newsy Bellingcat series. Doesn't it just sound more sophisticated now? This is a series that basically brings in satellite imagery, social media, and all kinds of open source reporting to build out some hard-hitting visual investigations. We wanted to show you a clip from one of those investigations that connects the dots between the U.S. and Saudi Arabian airstrikes that killed civilians. Here's that. Yemen has been devastated by a civil war that intensified in 2015 and is still ongoing. There are two main sides, the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels, who control the nation's capital, and the internationally recognized government of Yemeni President Mansur Hadi. Since the conflict started, it has become one of the worst humanitarian catastrophes in the world. One big factor is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia leads a coalition of mostly Arab states trying to dislodge the Houthis from power. They've been trying since 2015, using ground forces, airstrikes, and a crippling blockade. So far, there's been limited success. This war has killed thousands of civilians so far and driven millions from their homes. Saudi Arabia has the backing of powerful allies like the U.S., which provides weapons and logistical support for the airstrikes. Many of those strikes have hit civilians, not Houthi military targets. Here's one such example. A March 2016 strike on the al Khamis market in northwestern Yemen. This is what the market looked like a couple weeks before the strike. The blue-roofed structures are likely temporary structures set up as part of the market. The two airstrikes hit here, just west of these temporary buildings, at a busy roadside section of the market. Bellingcat was able to figure this out using a couple methods. First, a graphic video from the media center of Ansar Allah, a Houthi-ran outlet. In it, we can make out three buildings that can be geolocated on Google Earth satellite imagery. Human Rights Watch also visited the site of the airstrike later that month. Two of the same buildings can be geolocated, as well as a large crater from the airstrike. A second strike was reported near the first, though there's no open source evidence showing a second crater. In all, 107 civilians were reportedly killed in the strikes. 25 of those were children. The United Nations investigation said 10 of the bodies were burned beyond recognition. Based off the Human Rights Watch video and a report from British news station ITV, we can also link US-made munitions to the bombing. The ITV crew came across the remnants of a Paveway laser guidance kit while Human Rights Watch reportedly found evidence of a JDAM. Both are U.S. manufactured weapons. I think that's enough talking at the camera for this week. We'll be back Monday, same time, same place, for more In The Loop. Top stories from Newsy are coming right up.